So really what we're gonna talk about in this panel is about interdisciplinary research. Everyone here is coming from a little bit of a left field background, but working on biotechnology problems. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about problem driven research. So research that isn't necessarily led by, you know, a, a really interesting um, biotechnology based uh, tool or hammer, but rather by kind of trying to focus on users and their problems and then looking at the tool chest to see how we might solve that with a, a biological solution, if appropriate. Um, you know, these are really bold ideas, I think, is, is the message here. A lot of these are coming from very unusual uh, places and I think really tangible applications that touch on kind of industry, uh, consumer sectors, uh, and, and of course materials. Um, and I'm really excited as well that we'll have talks from, you know, or, or, or a talk about, um, you know, computational tools in, in, in biodesign. Um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to touch a little bit on education um, and how the sort of, you know, this field of interdisciplinary biological research uh, can really be, um, you know, maybe led or, or sort of pushed in the right direction through the right curricula. Um, so yeah, yeah, welcome to my, to my panel. And I might ask you guys just to sort of introduce yourselves, uh, you know, hopefully in under a minute if you, Break that boundary, no problem. Um, and I'll, I'll thank you for staying as well. Yeah, and thanks for listening uh, uh, so late in the day. Okay. So yeah, maybe Brenda, do you wanna? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Dr. Brenda Parker. I'm a biochemical engineer uh, by background, and I work at UCL. I'm also the um, founder and director of a new program that we're running there called Biointegrated Design, which sits between the world of architecture and biochemical engineering. What I'm really interested in is the sort of scale up um, of biological processes, biological manufacturing. Um, and in my other sort of hat that I wear is I work on microalgae. So I like to make my life extremely difficult uh, <laughs> by working with photosynthetic organisms as well. Hi, I'm Pierre. I'm one of the co-founders of Skipping Rocks Lab. Um, and uh, in a nutshell, we do sustainable packaging made from seaweed. So it's maybe better if I demonstrate. So the idea is to have little kind of like, um, like sachets um, for beverages, things like marathons, festivals, uh, where usually we use plastic. Uh, we've developed this as an alternative that is actually completely biodegradable because it's made from seaweed and it's also edible, so cheers. <laughs> <laughs> so you have no waste at the end. And so we've been developing this in London for the past five years and trying to leverage uh, like such a wonderful kind of like a natural resource, which is seaweed. That's a very cool <laughs> party trick. I don't have one up my slide as um, side, but um, my name is Natsai Audrey Chiesa. I am a designer with a background in architecture and material futures. Uh, last year, I started um, a company called Faber Futures, which is a design agency that's working at the intersection of biology, technology, and design. Uh, at Faber Futures, we're really interested in embedding design thinking at the early stage of um, a lot of the research that's happening. Um, and so it, it means that our agency is pretty sector agnostic. Um, anyone from the automotive to the beauty and fashion sectors is really interested um, to know how synthetic biology is going to impact what they do. And so we work as a bridge and as an interface between these two spaces. Um, but we also develop our own R&D. We're best known for um, our research into biopigments for textile dyes, which you can find at the um, Ginkgo Creative Residency um, booth upstairs. Um, and really, this is about trying to find new models of manufacturing using biology, um, but embedded within sustainable futures. I'm James, the founder of Lab Genius. We're a London-based venture-backed synthetic biology company combining automation with deep learning to engineer new proteins. Great, so uh, I guess my, my first question was, you know, I suppose, how do we work interdisciplinary? You know, how, how do you find yourselves working? Each one of you comes from a, a different background to the one you're kind of working in. Um, maybe you'd, you'd like to, to start, James, how, how does it work? Yeah, so I'm, I guess I'm a protein engineer by training, and when I did the PhD, um, all of that protein engineering knowledge was, was in my head, and it uh, turns out that people are really bad at protein engineering. Um, 
and uh, as, as humans, as, as individuals, or, or maybe we're relatively good in the sense that one human could be excellent, another one mediocre, but across the board, humans are relatively bad. And the way that we look at this problem is protein engineering is this incredibly high value sport, um, yet humans really struggle to grapple with the complexity of biological systems and the, with the simulators that exist in our skulls. Um, so we work as a multidisciplinary team not to solve the protein engineering problem, but to build a smart robotic platform that can. Uh, and so you're working at several steps removed, which makes the multidisciplinarity of it all the more important. So we've got a team of 30 people, that's software engineers, data scientists, data engineers, synthetic biologists, automation scientists, automation engineers, you, know, you name it, you're compiling all of those people together to build an intelligent platform to solve that problem. Um, and I can't begin to tell you how difficult that is. You need both really deep domain expertise, but you also need those people who can bridge between them. Um, and I would say that uh, when I started out on this adventure, I thought I was solving a technical problem. Actually, I think for us specifically, it's an organizational engineering problem. How do you assemble the right team with the right skills in the right way to tackle uh, these problems? Any, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, so our approach has been, um, I think, learned in many ways. I first started working in a lab um, as a, a, an undocumented visiting practitioner at UCL maybe um, nine years ago now. And this was a very uh, unstructured um, way of embedding design into that research lab. In, in other words, I got to do whatever I wanted to do as an individual actor. Um, that only gets you so far. In 2017, I, I went to Ginkgo Bioworks to figure out what it means to embed design thinking at a startup that is thinking of itself as a platform and therefore completely open to a consumer landscape um, and therefore um, the application space really opens up. And so the question we had was, um, how do we design um, space for design thinking to live there? Um, and, and I think I, I really concur with the idea that this is an organizational question. Um, how do you get everybody in the organization to understand what design is and how it might interact with the robots that they're interacting with? Um, and then how do you learn how to do that so that you can replicate that model and refine it? And so when we went, it was a pilot. We were learning by doing together um, what communication between uh, all sorts of different people looks like when the question is a design or societal question rather than a technical um, question. And then what are the learnings that we get from that to be able to initiate um, a program that then encourages other practitioners who, although they have a design background, it might be graphic design, it might be interaction design, it might be architectural design, completely different languages embedded even in that. And so, um, in, in many ways, the work of making that collaboration uh, between disciplines um, sort of materialize into something is very much ongoing. Um, but I think those principles to embed something uh, at the heart of an organization so that it can self-demonstrate itself um, and, and, and bring people into that process has, has been an incredible learning for us. I think for us, we are um, slightly maybe kind of like uh, less deep in science than some of the things that we might have heard about uh, today. But I think that there's a lot of uh, like parallels with uh, the idea of mixing a lot of different uh, kind of like type of uh, skill sets together. Um, and uh, essentially for creating the, our technology, we had to first of all create kind of like the material, uh, but we also had to create the, the machines for turning this material into like these kind of like filled sachets. And I think that uh, it took us a bit of time, but we uh, ended up doing all of this ourselves in-house in a space where we have like within the same space an engineering workshop, kind of like a, like a R&D lab that is actually a bit more like an industrial kitchen because everything we use is basically food ingredients. Uh, a production facility that is kind of like uh, food grade where we can uh, like have a really high uh, hygiene kind of like uh, level of, of control and our offices for everyone to be to be there and I think that being in such a kind of like small space altogether is where interesting things happen and and uh, like before getting to that we 
definitely kind of like learned the hard, hard way that uh, we had commissioned uh, like a Cambridge-based consultancy to help us develop the machine, but they, they needed to have like a completely specified material to make that machine kind of like work for them. And there was kind of like no chance we could make the material evolve along the way. So um, that's the kind of problems that we were facing. And I think that uh, once you're all in the same team and actually like um, recently we had a, like, um, an issue where we've made some really great progress on, on the machine and we have a really stable kind of like material recipe now, but uh, we were struggling with, with our like with this new design of the machine. And we just send that back to the chemist and, the, like, and telling them, okay guys, help us out here. And I think having this ability for everyone to challenge and kind of like progress things in parallel has been really beneficial. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly an iterative process. Um, so speaking as someone who collaborates with architects, we obviously want to make things at scale. That's actually what deeply interests me as well. Um, and I think there's a parity of our interests overall but our methodologies are completely um, different. Um, so I think when you begin a project like this, and it's certainly what you were describing, this iterative backwards and forwards, is immensely challenging for the scientists and the engineers on a team. Um, as, the as the sort of designers drive things forward, and next week it changes completely. So it's developing a kind of commonality of language, and I think it's something that Nat's I touched on, which is having the ability to go in to the other discipline space, if you like, and inhabit it and understand it. And it like, sort of facilitates that cross communication. So for me, it was really important if I was going to work at an architecture school, we had to build a lab because we have to understand the tools that both both kind of disciplines work with. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. I mean, so we're talking about someone who designs at the sort of molecular level all the way up to like the built environment. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty awesome. I mean, I suppose like this is maybe you know, feel, feel free just to, to jump in here, but I think all of us sort of are interested in sustainability um, in one way or another, right? Everything that, that, that we're doing has that uh, as, as a potential impact. Like, is there, you know, I suppose, Natsar, we were talking a bit about, like, is, is the linear kind of supply chain a, a problem that, that we're kind of feeding almost into? Or is perhaps, you know, um, you know, creating you know, disposable things are a really valid way to, to solve the problems. Do we need to kind of update that whole linear approach and maybe create something more circular? I, I don't know, what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Um, I actually see the circular economy more as a network because it's not always going to do this in the same way that it's not always going to do this. Um, so the answer to that question is we should be doing both and then it depends on the context. For example, the drop-in replacement, um, is going to be a way, particularly in, in um, biopigments, uh, it's, it's going to be a way in which we can really start to create impact in um, you know, the harm that dyes are causing in the environment. Um, as, as an example, water use, you have to scale the thing for it to make a difference. Um, but then a question that I have, and in, all, in, in my own practice is, um, then what we are actually doing, if we look at the fashion industry as it stands today, by creating the drop-in replacement um, and building the framework of that scale-up, um, the economy of that scale-up from an investment point of view, to, to service the denim industry, um, I see a problem with that because it's broken. So sometimes the drop-in replacement is actually servicing a broken system, a system that other actors who are not involved in synthetic biology, uh, for example, um, are, you know, they're working on actually shifting that. And so what we need to look at in terms of those models for, um, for future enterprise, or what we need to ask is, am I leveraging the full potential of this technology? Or am I just plugging it into a system that, you know, in 20 years' time is just not going to be able to, to cope given climate change, to cope given different consumer demands, um, to cope given completely different economic frameworks? So the, the, the question isn't necessarily when, when, you know, should we be doing drop and replacement or not? It's um, what is the holistic approach to innovation that future proofs this? Um, this technological intervention. 
So I mean, is there is there something you can do as a kind of a, a at a kind of company level? Like you were you were talking yesterday, James, like a little bit about how like governance of companies hasn't hasn't evolved. What you had a pretty nice figure. What was it? Like it hasn't evolved in like a hundred years. The the well, incorporation so documents of a business is there not not significantly no. But I but I think the things that you can do are um, really be thoughtful about defining things like your company values. That so so you can you can. Uh, run with exactly the same governance docs as every other VC-backed company, um, but really, um, as a collective, as a team collective, think about, be thoughtful about, enshrine the values um, of the company that you want to build. And, you know, it sounds corny, but really live them. And what that means on a practical basis, it means that really thoughtful about the direction and trajectory that that company grows in versus something that's more undirected and, and sort of purely profit-centric. So, like, my my mum lives in the west of Ireland, uh, you know, and, and she she's about sixty two years old. Uh, she's been working all her life, and and her argument about you know the kind of car she drives is very much like I have to drive to work. You know, if I can't drive a car, I can't work. It's easy for you Londonites to think that you can all take magic helicopters, you know, that run on fairy dust to work. But like those of us who who are out here in the west of Ireland have to actually drive somewhere, and. She phoned me up there a couple of weeks ago talking about what kind of car should she buy. Um, and we talked it through and we went through the numbers on a diesel. And then we actually went through the numbers on, um, on a hybrid car. And really the numbers started to add up. And her only comment that I thought was pretty impressive was, you know, I would really love an electric car because they're just so cool, but it's too expensive. And at no point did she kind of bring up sustainability as any motivator in her, her discussion. Um, so I suppose what I think is particularly sad is a bit of a segue into yourself here, but like what I think is particularly cool there is like it's a cool product, man. You know, like I, you know, I had a couple of them filled with gin at the V&A the other night. Like they are awesome. So like, you know. And I think that uh, like adding that uh, like fun element to it has been a, like a key part of like um, our kind of like progression into like a more established uh, startup now. And I think that um, you're totally right that um, obviously we are a sustainable com a packaging company, so we want to have like a positive sustainable impact. But one of the, like talking about the values, but like one of the things that we try to say like that really describes the kind of products we want to put out there is like we want to make it easy to be good. And um, like so easy cool. that you don't have to think about uh, sustainability in the first place is just something that is going to be really convenient or that's going to be really fun or that's going to have some kind of like added value. And I think that's where uh, design brings in what maybe um, like scientists might not like pick up in the first place. And I think that's definitely something that like uh, coming back to this multicultural kind of like group of people working together, that's, that's important. You know, talking about this interdisciplinary mindset, is there a kind of curriculum of the future? Or like, am I just kind of being stupid? And really, people should just specialize and then figure out ways to collaborate. Or is there an interdisciplinary kind of skill set that should be taught? Like, you know, is that, is that something you've, yeah. you've thought of? Or? Yeah, I think the first um, thing is, can you teach an interdisciplinary skill set or can you cultivate an interdisciplinary mindset? And yeah, so I, I mean, I come from an inherently interdisciplinary background. I work with the arts and sciences, the Basque program at UCL as well. And it's very much about approaching things with an inquiry-led mindset. So my job is to teach designers um, biology and also to teach, actually you could argue it's quite hard to teach sometimes biologists design. Um, and I think by doing this through an inquiry-led process, that's the only way I can see you can open those doors to people. I don't believe that um, not having you know, three years of biology undergraduate should be prohibitive to you working or understanding what to do in the lab. And especially if you have a very valid question that you need to answer, it's surprising the amount of knowledge you can gain. And especially with things like coding and the sort of democratization of knowledge, I personally don't see a problem with having an interdisciplinary degree. Because when you get into companies, um, quite often the complaint is and what stifles innovation is very much the siloed way of thinking, not the dearth of technical skills, because I fully believe that people with an interdisciplinary skill set can have often, you know, such a breadth of knowledge. Um, and I think the critique is always, oh, it's this dilettante mindset, which I really just totally reject. 
here's a biology lab, okay, you know, learn the ropes and then... Yeah, and the first practical we said, people, is like, find an organism and grow it. There you go. That's all you need to know. You need to, you know, <laughs> so get going. Yeah. Uh, um, I know that, like, uh, uh, so in, in, my, in, in my particular experience, uh, I did a master's between, like, joint master's between Imperial and uh, Royal College of Art called Innovation Design and Engineering. And I think that that's, that was a really good recipe for mixing lots of different people together. And I think that uh, probably in the future there's going to be something that involves like more of like uh, synthetic biology. But uh, like we had uh, designers, engineers, fine artists, architects, uh, people working fi uh, like finance, uh, medical doctors. It was just like a random group of people, and that was super helpful to like tack like tackle those problems. And I think that. Uh, creating those environments in academia is going to create a lot more alternatives. I think I'll probably just echo that. I, um, the creative industries are incredibly interdisciplinary. There's no design agency that can make anything today without having to consult a whole raft of different um, expertise uh, and expertise that fall in the will of the world you wish you could have, but actually you're not the best person for that. And so, so much of it is about negotiating um, with different practices to be able to build the thing. And then the next layer is, if that thing is biological, then what does that look like? Um, I don't know that we should necessarily be teaching biodesign as just biodesign, because I actually think it's bigger than that. There's a question about whether that is a master's program as opposed to something that is inherently taught at uh, BA level, so that um, at least this is kind of just common knowledge, um, so that by the time you start to specialize within a master's program, and pre-PhD, um, uh, design PhDs are a thing now, uh, that you really start to develop um, uh, a, a wider understanding of the thing before zooming in again. Um, if I look at it from, a, from an industry point of view, um, a lot of the people who I talk to don't want designers who've necessarily just studied biodesign because it's, uh, it isn't a field that has matured enough to be able to necessarily produce that um, that all-rounder, that really refined all-rounder. Um, and so I think that is a mat matter of time uh, before we start to see, um, you know, a few years down the line, what a couple of the courses, particularly here in London, will look like uh, at Central St. Martins at, um, at UCL. 